new series, uh, a very interesting one, I think a very pertinent one. We, they, we've really chosen some uh, good topics for the series this year, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and um, pertinent in its own way, as we'll see. So we will begin, as always, prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Our Father, um, other than the Mass, is probably the greatest prayer we have, right? I mean, Jesus gave us that and asked, how do we pray? That's pretty powerful stuff. And a lot of the Our Father talks about who we are mm -hmm. as human beings. Okay? So I thought that was appropriate. And that's what our topic is today. Um, the topic is fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, that's a, I, like that, I like that kind of catchy um, title. And really what we're talking about is who are we as human beings? And that's no simple topic. I'm not going to be able to exhaust that in a little over half an hour or whatever. Um, but today what I'd like to do is kind of, as we did in the first session in the last series, is lay kind of a foundation and kind of cover some basic things that we will expand upon. Um, so just real quick, an overview of the series. Um, as it says in your handout, um, an introduction to basically Christian anthropology. Anthropology is the 25 cent word that basically says the study of human beings. Okay? Um, and we're going to talk about human nature, we're going to talk about sin, horrible, horrible, and grace. Right? And that whole fits into that fearfully and wonderfully made concept. And in this first series, we're going to talk about things like original sin, which I also use the term the fall. I kind of prefer the fall of original sin, but they're interchangeable. We're going to talk about a thing called concupiscence, another 25 cent word. We'll unpack that. And then essentially our need for grace and sanctification. And we'll talk about those. And as I said, the essential question we're dealing with today is who are we? Sinners? Or saints. Well, um, then we see the big idea there, and we'll talk about that. And then session two, the topic is how Christ mediates grace to us. Grace is so important. It is the central thing that we really want to talk about because it's what enables us to fulfill who we are, to attain our ultimate end, which we can do in no other way. And that's why we need, why do we need Jesus? Well. We need Jesus for two reasons, as I'll talk about his example and his grace. Because without both of those, we're in trouble. Okay? And then the third session, uh, we're going to talk about the different types of grace. Grace is a big topic. And there we're going to talk about uncreated and created grace, operative and cooperative, actual and sanctifying, sufficient and efficacious. One, a lot of 25 cent words here. And um, should I really let God take control of my life? These are good questions. And to be honest, um, I think there's some pretty straightforward answers to this. Yep, yep, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. That's right. And in the last session, talking about really our ultimate destination, the ultimate goal of our lives, and that is our union with the Trinity in heaven. Right? So that's kind of like the capstone of the whole thing. And uh, what's the point of being a Christian? Well, sounds like a good question, and hopefully we'll be able to provide some good answers. Okay, so that's kind of a little high-level overview. And today, the first session, I want to lay some groundwork. So, let's get into it. Our question, who are we? Sinners or saints? Okay. Well, the simple answer there is uh, both. <laughs> okay, right? But let's try to put a little substance behind that. Okay, so yes, both. Well, let's give some examples. I think examples can help bring that truth home. 
Okay, so first example I'll give you. From World War II, the concentration camps, or were also referred to as the death camps. Not good things, right? But let's, let's think about that for a second with regard to who we are as human beings. Human beings created and ran the concentration camps. Human beings created almost inconceivable evil. Many human beings were overwhelmed, dehumanized, and brutally killed in these camps. Fearfully made. And human beings overcame that evil. First, by finding ultimate and transcendent meaning in the camps to keep sane and survive the torture of these camps. Human beings did that. Second, human beings, by allowing this transcendent meaning to empower them to walk upright and face an unjust and horrible death with prayers of trust, hope, and love on their lips. And lastly, it was human beings who recognized the evil and ultimately defeated it militarily. We, always, we must remember and always keep in mind both sides of that equation. We can't just focus on one side or the other. Okay? Tough stuff. Next, a little bit more current. 9-11 terror attacks, right? Human beings committed this evil. Many human beings were killed by this evil. But, and, human beings, especially many first responders, heroically ran into that evil, putting their own lives in danger. Many of them lost their lives. And why did they do that? To save others. It is important to realize this fact about us human beings. Okay? We are capable of truly amazing, heroic, selfless acts. And we are capable of almost inconceivable, unimaginable, horrible evil. Let that seep in. It's so important to understand who we are. But I also want to add a third dimension, if you will, to this equation. And that was explained so very well by a man named Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was in, he was um, in prison in the Soviet Ula, okay? And he wrote some incredible, incredible stuff. And to paraphrase his great, one of his great quotes, he said, the battle line between good and evil that's what we're talking about, runs not between groups of people such that we can separate the good people and then the evil people over here, this kind of group thing. Okay? He was very much against that. He said, no, the battle line doesn't run between groups of people. It runs right between ourselves, right down the middle of our hearts. That is such an important, important point, especially today, where groupthink is, is, is much more on the rise than maybe in, in previous times, in our, my own lifetime at least. So no groupthink from a Catholic perspective, right? There's also a term called scapegoating, which kind of goes hand in hand with this. Does anyone know what scapegoating is? What is a scapegoat? Anyone? Yeah, right, because going back in time, there was literally a goat, right? And symbolically, they would impose all of their, their sins, their evil acts, whatever you want to call them, okay, onto the goat. Take it off, put it on there, and then they would send the goat out of town, right? They would get rid of the goat. And the symbolism there is that evil's gone, no more evil. 
not from a Catholic perspective. Not so easy. Not so easy. And that's why it says we are born sinners, but we are called to be saints. We have the capacity, given God's grace, to overcome the evil within ourselves and within the world and become saints. From a Catholic perspective, we all have that dual capacity. We can become wretched. We can become saintly. Okay. So that's the groundwork. Let's elaborate on that. Let's not leave it there. Let's go get to a better place. So born sinners. Why do we call? Why do we say we're born sinners? Well, that gets us to the fall or original sin. I use those terms interchangeably, as I said. Um, Catholics believe that we were created by God. How? Well, perfect. Right? Because how else could God create us? He created us perfectly. Well, geez, Bob, if that's the case, what happened? Mary, we just celebrated, right? Um, Friday, the um, Immaculate Conception. Um, a lot of people get that confused, thinking that had to do with Jesus. No, it had to do with Mary. Uh, Mary was born how? Mary was born sinless. And she is the only human person born, how was she born? Full of grace. And that's a key concept to what we're talking about here. She was full of joy and holiness as well. And that's our goal, right? Holiness and joy. And sometimes people say, well, wait, what about Jesus? Right? Mary was the only one born without sin. <laughs> only, well, I said only human person. So now we're getting into a little Christology, right? Jesus was what? He was a divine person who assumed but a human nature to himself. So Mary was the only human person, but she is our fallen nature's one book, greatest book. Right? So we hold her in such high regard and respect. We, however, are born into this world separated from full communion with God and His grace. We were not born full of grace. Only miracles. And this is the concept of the fall or original sin. And this is represented by the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay? So God created us perfectly, but here in this world, we are detached from God's full communion and, full, and we're not full of grace. And so therefore, we have this fallen nature. Okay? And this predisposes, as we we're going to talk to, all of us towards sin. But, that's the bad news, if you will. Right? And you always have to do the bad news first, because then you appreciate the good news. And the good news is that we are called and empowered to be saints, to become saints. So I want a couple of, a couple of concepts here. One is redemption. As Catholics, we should be very familiar with this term because each and every one of our lives are meant to be redemptive stories. Your life is a story, and our goal, each of our goals, is to use God's grace to make it a redemptive story. And before you can be redeemed, you first have to fall. So that means that sin is active in each of our lives. But that is not the end of the story. The story goes on. With grace, we can overcome <coughs> our sinfulness and our falls and our mistakes. The Catholic Church teaches that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, humanity has the opportunity for redemption and salvation. Right? It's not like it's automatic. Christ's death and resurrection makes available and offers us the grace necessary for forgiveness, when you talk about sin, you've got to talk about forgiveness, and transformation. And ultimately, as in our fourth session, 
we're going to talk about the ultimate transformation, and that's union with the Trinity. So we have redemption. The next concept I want to talk about is sanctification. You've probably heard the word sanctification, but sometimes we don't always understand it as well as we should. But as Catholics, we believe in the process, and it is a process, of sanctification, whereby each of us as individuals are gradually, you were there, gradually, it's not like you just flip a switch, made holy to the grace of God. And our cooperation and participation, those I love those words, cooperation and participation with that grace. God honors us, respects us enough to want us to work with him in his work of redemption and sanctification. We're part of it, and that's a great honor, but it's also a great responsibility. Sanctification is kind of tied to the word saint, right? The term saint in the Catholic tradition does not only refer to those who are officially canonized by the church. Please don't limit your concept of sainthood to that. That's very true, but each and every one of us, as the Second Vatican Council, one of the themes of the Second Vatican Council was the universal call to holiness. Hopefully you've heard that. Well, holiness there is the universal call to sainthood. We are all called to be saints, and in fact, each and every person who makes it to heaven is a saint. And so hopefully, you have known many saints, personally, hopefully. Okay, that's kind of a cool concept to think about. And I don't know about you, but I want to get to heaven. Okay? And therefore, I want to be a saint. And not just be a saint. So, a little summary on that first part there. Okay, from the Catholic perspective, human beings are born with a fallen nature, one that is not in full communion with God's grace, that is so important to realize, and this makes us prone to sin. So we're not in full communion with grace, but we have <coughs> access to grace, and we can't do anything without grace. So God initiates the process and gives us start, starter grace, if you will and then we progress. Okay? However, through the redemptive work of Christ and the ongoing process of sanctification, we are brought into fuller and fuller communion with God's grace. And through this process, the goal is ultimately to become a saint. So the recognition of human sinfulness that we talked about in kind of the bad news is balanced by the hope and belief in the transformative power of God's grace. Okay, so do you see the balance that we're kind of talking, we're trying to walk a line here? Okay, so let's go back to the dark side for a second and talk about concupiscence, right? That's the big 25 cent word. In Catholic theology, concupiscence refers to this inclination or tendency within each and every human being, right? Not just certain groups of human beings, but each and every human being, that means each of us, towards sin. Right? There's something missing. There's something broken, if you will, in us, each and every one of us. And it leads us, has a tendency and an inclination towards sin. And as I said, it's closely connected to the doctrine of the fall, or original sin, that human nature is wounded and inclined towards sin. That wounded is often spoken of. And that's, that concept of, of concupiscence is rooted in the understanding that our human condition, each and every one of our human condition, after the fall, is so wounded, and our inclinations are towards sin. Okay? So the fall, we're going to talk about the fall, but some of the effects of the fall. Catholics believe that the fall, it disrupted, I guess you could say, the harmonious relationship between God and humanity, and introduced a fallen nature into each and every one of us. And concupiscence is considered to be one of the effects of the fall. And we're going to talk about, there's like four that have been identified, and concupiscence is one of them. 
and as I said, it refers to this disordered inflammation of human, our desires and our appetites is also the way it's spoken of. Um, they're disordered, and that leads us to become more susceptible to sinful thoughts, actions, and tendencies. So that's the, we're talking about the dark side here. Start going to the positive side. Baptism and grace. Let's talk a little bit about that. Catholics believe that through the sacrament of baptism, the guilt of the fall or original sin is removed, and individuals are infused with sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is God's really God's life with us, and that's really what starts us on our journey. Right? You got we what can we do without God's grace? Nothing. God starts the process by infusing uh, sanctifying grace in our souls. However, concupiscence, the 25 cent word there, remains as a consequence of the fall even after baptism. And individuals, each and every one of us, continue to struggle, key word there, with the inclination towards sin throughout our lives. It's always there, we're always fighting it. Struggle and redemption. We struggle, but our goal is redemption. The recognition of concupiscence underscores the ongoing spiritual struggle that we all experience. However, Catholics believe that with the help of God's grace, the good news is, is we can resist and overcome the temptations associated with concupiscence. The process of sanctification, kind of what we're talking about there, includes a life of faith, prayer, the development of human virtues, and the sacraments. And we have to cooperate with God's grace in order to progress in this process of sanctification. So if that's the case, then as I say all the time, we need God's grace. So what should be a key thing in our thoughts? How do we get this? Right? And God has been so kind because he's given, up, he's given us a whole spectrum of ways of obtaining his grace. Use all of them. And the sacraments, prayer, uh, study, uh, the practice of good works and virtues. Use everything available to you. Alright, next concept. The fall or original sin. It's a complicated topic. I guess I can say that. Um, and I don't want to go into it too deeply because you can get tangled up. But the Catholic, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says the account of the fall in Genesis, which you've all heard numerous times, I'm sure, uses figurative language. Key word there. Okay? Uh, don't get caught up in like it, it's the it's a um, description from the New York Times or something of an event that occurred, you know, down in New York last week. Okay? Figurative language. But it affirms that the whole of human history is marked by the original fault freely committed by our first parents. Okay? But the figurative aspect of that is important. St. Thomas Aquinas said that the fall of Adam and Eve brought four wounds, there's that term wounds again, to human nature. Right? What are they? Well, number one, um, the whole idea of a fall in nature, um, the original sin, really what that is is the lack of sanctifying grace. And, and what resolved that? We just talked about baptism, right? We just talked about that. Next, concupiscence. There's our word. And really, uh, one way of looking at concupiscence is the soul's passions, right? The passions, our emotions, our feelings, um, are no longer properly ordered, right? And we talked about that, if you remember, in our, in our moral series. So there's a natural disorder, if you will. We're all disordered. <laughs> um, and, that's, and that leads us to sin. Next, the other, next wound, third wound, physical frailty, and death. 
Now, I don't know about you guys, but the older I get, the more real those things become, right? And then lastly, what he called a darkened intellect and ignorance. In other words, we don't always think perfectly clearly, and our, our range of knowledge is limited. Fair enough? Yep. I know that applies to me. Okay. And these negative effects impacted the four original gifts that God gave to Adam and Eve, if you will. Once again, figuratively representing humanity. What are that? Number one, sanctifying grace. Number two, a, a marvelous integrity of our emotions, of our feelings. They actually work with us to move us towards what? The true, the good, and the beautiful. I don't know about you, but sometimes my emotions don't do that. Right? But the first gift and what we're trying to get back to is that integrity of our emotions. Next, immortality. There's an interesting insight from modern psychology and psychiatry. And that is, is that none of us can imagine non-existence. None of us can imagine non-existence. Think about it. We can talk about it, but we can't imagine it. And I would say that that's connected to that spark of the divinity within us and our original gift of immortality. Because that's what we're destined for. And lastly, infused knowledge. Think of that as the knowledge we gain when we are properly in union with God. Because what's God? God is all knowledge. And as we become more unified with God, that knowledge is, in a sense, infused into us. That sounds like a good thing. And it is. We are born with a fallen human nature, causing us to be subject to ignorance, suffering, the dominion of death, and we are inclined to sin. Okay. So that's the tough stuff. Now let's get back to some more upbeat stuff. We're in the dark picture. Now let's show, see if we can find some light. St. Thomas insight. I love St. Thomas. And he said, I'm paraphrasing, we were made for and desire in the deepest and innermost, our innermost heart of hearts, deep down, we desire an end, a goal, or a destiny so great, so beyond the powers and goods that anything in this world can provide us. That's, but we realize we cannot attain it on our own. Think about that. Once again, we can't even conceive of non-existence. There's something inside us that wants a love that doesn't end, that wants a life that doesn't end, that wants goodness, that wants love. We want all these things, and we want them not just in little samples. Okay, I, have, I had enough love. I don't need any more. Right? No, no. We want it endlessly, and we want it forever. Yes. But look around. And what Thomas would say is, look around. Can anything provide that for you? And the, the tough answer there is, no. No, this world can't satisfy that innate human need. And it's a universal need. It's not just some people. Universal need. We need God's grace. That's the follow-up to Thomas's insight. He says, we need God's grace to attain our ultimate fulfillment. And that's what this next part of the series is about. Our ultimate destiny. To attain what we were made for. Nothing else can do that. Now, C.S. Lewis, another one of my favorites, had a great quote, which I love. And I'll read that directly, because his English is a little better than Thomas's. Um, if we find ourselves, find in ourselves, a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. And Lewis, you know, he goes on and says, you know, 
We have hunger, universal desire for food, and there's food. We have a desire for love, and there are people to love and be loved by. <clears throat> All the universal desires have something to satisfy them. The desire for eternal life, eternal love, there's something to satisfy that. As human beings, we can only arrive at that other world, as Lewis put it. We can only attain our ultimate fulfillment through the power of Jesus Christ. And people ask me sometimes, well, what's so special about Jesus? Why do, what, why do we need Jesus? What did Jesus really do for us? And everyone points, of course, to the cross. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. But if you want to break it down to two simple things, Jesus gave us the perfect example of what we have to live, how human beings can live in their fullness. Example. But just like a parent, if, you, if you're a parent, if you know parents, if you've ever seen a parent, if you've ever been a child, um, if people tell you, or a teacher at school, they can tell you what to do, or a coach, but if they don't give you the resources, if they don't give you the teaching, if they don't give you the instruction, if they don't give you the power to actually do what you're supposed to do, what good is that? So Jesus gave us the perfect example of what it means to live the full life, the fullest life to the fullest, if you will. But he also gave us the power to do it, and that's grace. So I, it's just kind of an easy way to think of it. He gave us the example, and he gave us the power of grace to live and to do it. Okay. So how do we move towards sainthood and overcoming our sinful tendencies? Well. We must seek God's grace, as I said, through all the available means, and follow Christ's example. But what does that look like? What does holiness, and that's really what that is, what does holiness look like? Well, holiness looks like the saints, right? And there are a lot of different saints. You know, it's not like every saint's story is the same. So, I'm going to try to distill down for a court, you know, for the sense of this talk, um, seven kind of significant and, and, and essential human qualities that help us understand who we are as human beings and how we can utilize God's grace to grow towards sainthood and help us live well-adjusted, truly fulfilled, and genuinely holy lives. Quite sure. Let's see what I can do. Very, very quick overview of those. And you know, I often compare our secular world, the world that we live in, and the the worldview that it gives us, and the Christian worldview. Okay, how how we are to understand ourselves and our world, and that's really what we're talking about here today. Who are we, and what's our world, and how should we act? How should we interact with the world, and how should we treat others and interact with others? Christianity offers a much more balanced, healthier, and graceful, graceful, alternative. Christianity says, in yourself, you're a sinner. But in Jesus Christ, you're absolutely and utterly loved. This understanding of ourselves gives us a unique combination of both humility, right, I'm a sinner, that, that should bring humility, but also confidence, a confident humility, as I like to say. And that's, a, that's like a paradox, because it doesn't seem to make sense, but it's true. No other philosophy of life, no other religion, can give you that wonderful and powerful combination in the same way as Christianity. You should not feel superior to anyone because of your awareness of your own sinfulness and the sinfulness within you each of our human natures. However, you should also not feel less than anyone, because you are the king's child. I've been watching The Crown. So I'm <laughs> you are God's adopted child, 
an heir to heavenly glory. God has made the grace, given us the grace that we need to attain sainthood. And it is available to us through the work of Jesus Christ. Our salvation is primarily Christ's work, not ours. But he gives us the honor, the privilege, and the responsibility of participating in his work. So therefore, there's a humility and a confidence at the same time. And as I said, only Christianity gives us this potent combination. And please, please, the emphasis here is that God's grace is absolutely necessary for us to attain this. Once again, seek it through all available means. Okay, so what are some of the things that God's grace does for us? Well, there are endless things that God's grace does for us. I don't want to make believe that this is an exhaustive list. But I just came up with seven that I want to talk about real quick. First, meaning in our lives. If you talk, if, if you hear me talk at all, if you talk with me, sooner or later I will get to meaning and the importance of meaning because it's absolutely central to both who I am and who I believe what Christianity is all about. The grace of Christ gives us a unique, lasting, and ultimate, keyword there, ultimate and transcendent meaning that transcends our temporal world that is so important. Our culture offers us meaning as well, which can be very good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's nothing good in our world. That's not true. Not a Catholic persuasion. Absolutely. But the key thing there is like the meaning, any meaning that you can derive from within this world, from the things of this world, which can be very good, the key there is that any meaning so derived can be taken away from you. Think of those people in the concentration camps. Many of them were very wealthy, very successful people, but everything was taken away from them. What do you have left when everything is taken away? And those people that survived or acted and maintained their dignity were people who found a transcendent, or who had a transcendent meaning to hold on to. That's so, so important. The meaning Christ gives us, that meaning which is connected to him, that gives us ultimate and transcendent meaning, a meaning that cannot be taken away. That is so important. Second, all psychology and, and, and just all the social science will tell us that the one thing that we're all seeking is what? Anybody? What, what, is, what, is they, what does psychology tell us that everyone seeks? Happiness. Love. Happiness. Yes, love would be a way of attaining happiness, right? Every, all of our choices, it, we make our choices, good or bad, in the search of happiness. Absolutely. But, not all happiness is the same, right? The grace of Christ gives us a unique type of satisfaction and contentment that is truly lasting because it is not based on earthly circumstances, right? Or our emotions and feelings at a given moment in time, right? These, what I call fleeting feelings of contentment, which aren't bad themselves, I personally like them, right? I think we all do. But they are not what we are ultimately seeking. In the deepest recesses of our being, no, we are seeking joy. Joy is the greatest form of happiness because it is based in and connected to the transcendent God of Christianity. And this form of happiness, joy, cannot be taken away by anything in this world. And hopefully you can kind of see a common grounding between the type of meaning that we're given in Christianity and the type of hope that Jesus gives us and the happiness, the joy that's derived from it can't be taken away. Third, freedom. You know, we hear a lot about freedom. Freedom is good. Uh, we live in the land of the free. 
and home of the brave. The grace of Christ gives us a unique freedom that comes with the knowledge of divine truth. Truth and freedom have to go together. Because if you lose truth, then you lose freedom. Okay? And the freedom that Christ offers us is unique because it empowers us to live for God and God's plan for our life, not our own plan. Right? Um, the with, this wisdom is based on, uh, what I've, and I've talked about this before, a perfectly logical insight. Very hard to deny, in my opinion, if you believe in God. Then God, you have to believe that God knows better than we do what is ultimately best for us and our loved ones. So freedom is to choose in those and along with that line of what God knows is best for us and the truth of that. So truth, goodness, if we freely choose to move with those in that direction, then that is true freedom. And we talked a bit about that in our morality series. So there's a unique freedom that the grace of God, grace of Jesus Christ gives us. Fourth, a moral code or compass. The grace of Christ gives us a unique moral code and compass that contains actual moral obligations, not just moral feelings. That is so, so important, right? I feel this is wrong. I feel this is right. Good. Moral feelings are good. But why do I have to do that? Why should I do that? Because my feelings can change. Uh, my feelings change all the time. So maybe tomorrow, maybe I won't feel them. That's very shaky ground upon which to make moral decisions. Right? Emotivism um, is very common today. But it's not the solid basis upon making moral decisions. Right? Christian moral decisions are built on the dual foundation of faith and reason. Once again, I'm tying a number of our previous series together here. Um, and not on just pure emotions. Our faith is based on God's revelation, right? That um, a unique source of knowledge, a privileged source of knowledge that comes from God himself, the creator of the universe, the creator of ourselves. And this is a source of truth and goodness that helps guide us to apply the powers of our reason Right? God doesn't want autonomous. He wants us to use our reason to choose the good, to choose the beautiful, to choose the truth. And that helps us guide us in our moral decisions. Right? So that's another gift of God's grace. The whole concept of morality and Christian morality. Very common idea. Now, fifth, the fifth gift, if you will, the fifth benefit of grace is an identity. This is a little different, right? Morality, we talked about some of these things. The grace that Christ gives us gives us a unique identity, different from any other, and certainly different from an identity that our society around us, our culture around us gives us. Why? Because if you think about it, the identity that you get from the world around us, it's based that is something that you have to achieve. Do certain good things, you get an identity. Go to a good school, you get an identity. Do well at your job, you get a promotion. You get an identity, right? It's an achieved thing. Now, I'm not, I'm not questioning achievement, and I'm not questioning the value of that. Not at all. But think about it. If your life, if the value of your life is based on your performance, what you do, that can run into some problems. Rather, Christian identity is not something that we achieve. It's not achieved, it's received. We receive it, based, and that's based on Christ's love for us. Can we change that? No. Can we deserve it? No, not really. No. It's not achieved. 
You don't earn God's love. It is given to you. And that changes everything. Our identity as Christians is not achieved, it is received. So important. It doesn't wax and wane depending on your self-esteem or your self-regard at a certain point in time. Oh, I'm feeling good. God loves me. It doesn't wax and wane depending on how successful you are at work or in your career, in your life. Those are good things. I hope your family's doing well. But that's not what gains you your identity. Our identity is... You know, if our identity is based on our performance, here's the thing. What that means is, is that we might be humble. Going back to my little thing about humble. If you're not living up to your standards at a given point in time, right? If you're not making the amount of money that you thought you should be making, if your family isn't doing as well as it should, or your relationships, or your job, or I don't know, whatever it is that you're basing your identity on, if that's not, if that's not going very well, you may be humble. But you know what? you will not be as confident for those same reasons. If you're living up to your standards, you might be very confident, proud, and even bold, but usually self-righteous and potentially condescending towards others. You get kind of happy with yourself. You ever see that? But if your identity is received, then that changes that. You can, regardless of what's happening in your life, you know who you are, and you know how valuable you are. Can't be taken away. Sixth, hope. We are innately, as human beings, talking about who we are as human beings, we are hope-based people. If you take away someone's hope, what happens? You quit, you know? That's despair. The lack of any hope is despair. And despair leads to death. That is very that is a not a good situation. <clears throat> and hope is about something in the future. And the key thing there is that one of the things I want to stress is that your understanding of that hope in the future, that impacts how you experience the moment, right now, your present. But even among the world religions, right? Because, you know, like all the other religions, Christianity gives us a future hope that transcends this world. That's the difference between a religious perspective and a secular perspective. The historical religions, all of them, they gave us some sort of transcendent hope, and that's why it's so much better. Religious people handled the suffering and the difficulties of life so much better than a purely secular person because all the religions give us that, and that's a great value. But Christianity, even among the world religions, offers a hope that is unique and different. How so, Bob? Well, we are offered everlasting life. That's not unique. But we will enjoy perfectly loving relationships with God and all other people who will ever come into existence. That is unique. Right? The, the hope and the, of eternal life, the hope that that's there, it is personal. We don't go into a cosmic ocean. Right? It is transcendent. And there is a loving, personal relationship that is so unique to Christianity. God Jesus Christ said, I do not call you servants. I call you friends. That is different than anything else. To many, God, we are servants purely. Right? It's a master-slave almost relationship. He's the big guy, and we're just his underling. No, Jesus Christ said, you are friends. That is very, very unique. Who are we as human beings? We are friends of God. That's something very, very special.
And that hope can get us through anything that life throws at us. How valuable is that? And lastly, love. Christianity gives us Christ's personal example of what divine agape love is all about. And Jesus won for us the grace necessary to actually love God, others, and ourselves in this manner. Like I said, he didn't just show us this. Hey, this is great. Do it. How do I do it? Oh, I don't know. You can figure it out. No. He gave us both his example, the perfect example, and the grace to do it. Otherwise, we would never know what the greatest love of all, Whitney Houston's song aside, um, we wouldn't know what the greatest love of all even looks like. What does it entail? What does it require of us to love like Jesus Christ loves? We wouldn't know what, God, what that would entail if Jesus didn't give us the example, and we wouldn't be able to do it if he didn't give us the grace. Okay? It is extremely difficult for us to live truly fulfilling human lives. That's the bad news, if you will. But the good news is that with the grace and example of Jesus Christ, we can develop the virtues within us and progress in holiness, process of sanctification, overcome our concupiscence, trying to tie in all our 25 cent words today, and become the saints God calls us. Any questions about what we talked about? Yes? So, getting back to Adam and Eve and the fall and everything. Yes, great topic. If they had, I don't, I don't remember the term you used, perfect intellect or unlimited intellect. Preternatural gifts is a term that's sometimes used. But yep. So they had that Original as well justice. as integrated emotions. Okay? Yes. Then why did they fall? I mean, why, great were, question. why did they believe the serpent? over God. And and also, not only that, but God didn't want them to eat from the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I think he was saving that for the future when they were ready for it or something. So if their intellect was so perfected, why, it seems to me they were almost naive and innocent and didn't have much of an intellect. Yes. I'm not trying to contradict no. what you're saying. Oh, no, 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 no. I love, I love what you're saying. And I completely agree with it. And that's why, and I didn't want to get into it because it can be a sticky topic. But thank you for bringing it up, because since you did, I, I can at least discuss it. One thing a lot of Western Catholics like us, of the Latin Rite, don't understand um, is that there are two streams of thought with regard to interpreting the creation story of Adam and Eve, right? There's the Western that kind of goes through Augustine and then a lot of interpreters of Augustine. And that's where your point comes, right? There's, I think there's a, um, a potential snag in that thought, particularly as we have learned about the history of humanity and the world, right? Um, we know that the first human beings um, were um, perfect, right? I mean, they, they didn't have, um, they, it was a progression, right? And that kind of works against this idea that in time, and that now we're getting the combination of eternity and time, um, how does God create? God creates by his word, remember we talked about that? And God creates instantaneously. It's the eternal now in heaven, right, in the eternity. And we also know that time and space was created. The Big Bang, whatever you want to call it. So there's a relationship between time and space and, and eternity. The Eastern thought, um, St. Athanasius, uh, Maximus the Confessor, uh, others, um, even Origen, um, they said, no, 
we didn't, we didn't start out in time perfectly. God created us. Like we, you hear in the scriptures, God knew us before we were born. God knows everything and is eternal now. And we were created perfectly. I said God created us perfectly. How else could God create? Created perfectly in eternity. And then the fall, from an Eastern perspective, is going from the eternal now where we were created perfectly and completed. We fall into time. And we come into time limited, and that's the fallen human nature. Fall, the fall from down, get it? Um, and so therefore, it wasn't like Adam and Eve in time create, uh, sinned, and then all of a sudden, boom, things changed. No. They were created perfectly. Like you said, how could they sin up here? It doesn't make sense. But when they fell down into time, now we became limited beings, and now we are progressing towards back to where we began. So in a sense, we are participating in God's instantaneous act of perfect creation. Because we couldn't participate in that instantaneously. We are time-bound beings. And therefore, and there's a value to that. Why? Why not just make it perfect right from the beginning, Bob? Then there will be no free will. There's no freedom, and there's no, we as human beings, as much as we don't want to admit it, as much as we would love to deny it, as much as we would love to make it go away, we benefit from challenge, we benefit from difficult moral decisions, we difficult, we, we benefit, like, we are more like muscles, okay, than rivers. Rivers go the path of least resistance and they grow that way. Muscles grow in, against resistance and hard work. Our souls are more like muscles than rivers. We grow through difficult choices and difficult environments, and that's and God knows that, and we now participate in that, heading towards our fulfillment. And we are part of that. Just like when you're teaching your kid, okay, have them be part of the process. Don't just do it for them. Have them participate in it. And that that because I think I often when I think about my children and how I should act, I think about how God is acting with me. And God doesn't just do it for me. He says, Bob, you want that? Great. Right. Okay, you want to do that? You want to grow in holy? Great. Right. Okay. You have to do something. You have to, he's not going to just make it happen. And that's because that's how we grow as who are we as human beings? We are people that grow through challenge and difficulties and tough moral decisions and making mistakes. You know, like uh, Miss Frizzle. Make mistakes, get dirty. That's how we grow and learn. Okay? So I prefer the Eastern perspective than the Western in that particular thing with regard to the interpretation because it just makes more sense. And I think it's more historically in line with what we know about the, uh, the, the way human beings came into existence. Um, so I think your point <clears throat> is very good and it's very true. Uh, because it never made sense to me, particularly as, as you get into what is described as the preternatural gifts. You sit there and you say, well, how did they fall? Well, you know, how did that happen? It, would, it, doesn't, make, it doesn't make a lot of sense, um, to me at least. Um, so that's my opinion. And I always try to distinguish my opinion from what the church teaches. Because the church doesn't teach one or the other. That's a key point. I can say that. Um, it does not give you a definitive statement because there's two theological paths in church history that goes there. You know, everybody thinks the Catholic Church, they, you gotta do this, you gotta believe that. No. 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 There's a tremendous plurality in theological thought, which I love. The church does make statements at times, which thankfully, because that's our mother keeping us on track, but she also keeps it open. Yeah, we're allowed to use our reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's two theological paths. Um, I personally, speaking for my own self, I prefer the Eastern path because it just makes sense that it's a process, it's a development, and that God honors us and privileges us to be part of that and to work with him in that process. And the only way we can do that is in time, because we're talking about creatures. Long-winded answer to that. But thank you for that question. Thank you.